Hello, um, good afternoon and um, good evening um, to all. Um, my name is Nitya Panupat, the Executive Director of the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, or IHRI, uh, which is based in Bangkok, um, Thailand. And um, I'm also a non-industry co-chair of the Industry Lesson uh, Forum. It is my pleasure um, today to open this second round table um, in the series uh, focusing on reaching the 95-95-95 um, targets. Um, how can industry contribute? And um, to um, assessing and addressing the gap between knowledge of HIV status and treatment initiation is a priority in the HIV care continuum. And not only in linkage to care, a, a, a necessary uh, first step for initiation of ART and viral suppression, but it also plays a crucial role in treatment for prevention. Um, and despite remarkable advances in engaging people who know their HIV status in ART, it is not possible to achieve this target without a significant focus on retention um, in care as well. This second event will provide an overview of diverse and targeted strategies in improving linkage to and retention um, in care. Um, the aim is to engage the industry in developing and adopting strategies, um, including engagement with legislators and healthcare implementers, which would support improving linkage to and engagement in care. As a reminder, um, here are a couple of housekeeping rules for uh, this round table. The, this roundtable will be recorded. Um, the recording will be made available to the participants and on the IAS platform as part of the educational materials after all um, the necessary consents have been acquired. By staying in this meeting, you consent to being recorded for this um, uh, portion of the roundtable. And we encourage you to send questions um, to our presenters at any time through the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. They will be addressed during the panel discussion and throughout um, this roundtable. And please remember to focus your questions um, on today's roundtable uh, theme. Uh, questions about the third 95 target will be addressed in the session three on uh, the 23rd of May, um, respectively. And we kindly ask all participants to stay muted uh, with um, the camera off throughout the duration of the round table. And um, I would also like to emphasize that the Industry Liaison uh, Forum aims to provide stakeholders involved in the HIV response with a neutral platform um, to foster dialogue and action um, along the HIV prevention, diagnosis, um, and care continuum. We might not find answers to all challenges today, but it is an important step toward um, the uh, in, in identifying um, areas where the industry can contribute to achieving the 95 targets um, by 2025. And before I'm starting, now I would like to pass the mic to my co-chair of the Industry Lesson Forum, Helen McDowell, for a brief introduction. Thank you. Helen, over to you. Thanks, Natalia. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, depending on, on where you're joining from. Um, my name is Helen McDowell. And I'm Head of Government Affairs and Global Public Health at Vive Healthcare and the Industry Co-Chair of the Industry Liaison Forum of the IAS. Um, like Natalia, I'm very excited to be here with you all today um, and really excited about the discussion that we can have um, with the breadth of expertise that we have joining us today about discussing the innovative and building on the existing strategies that we have collectively learned that work to drive better linkage and retention in care of people living with HIV. So a warm welcome um, to everyone who's joined us, especially our guest presenters and panelists, but also to all of those of you who are hopefully here ready and um, uh, excited to, to be part of this conversation. The first section of the session today will be a number of presentations um, and then following this we will have a panel discussion um, where we will be really looking to dig deeper into discussion around the ways in which you know we could all work differently and, and build on um, that 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 experience and ability to link more patients to care. It is quite a packed agenda so um, politely request that all of the speakers um, 
are um, concise and don't go over there a lot of time um, and the, in the discussion that you know we are as concise as we all can be to try and make sure we get um, maximum output um, from from the discussion today um, to save on some time we do have detailed biographies of all of the speakers and panelists um, that will be accessible through the link um, which my colleagues from the IAS um, will put in the chat uh, soon and uh, so with that, um, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Ruwan, um, who is a South African uh, physician scientist and chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And um, Ruwan is going to provide us with a presentation on closing the gaps in the HIV care continuum. Uh, over to you, Ruwan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction and for the great honor to be with all of you today. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening wherever you are. It's my job today to talk a little bit about closing the gaps in the HIV care continuum, and specifically to provide an overview of where we are, what works, and some thoughts about the next steps. Here are my conflicts of interest. And I want to start today with the three main take-home points. First, partnership, science, and innovation have dramatically increased linkage to antiretroviral therapy, viral suppression, and retention and care. Second, we need to think and act differently to reach priority populations who do not yet have access to continuous HIV care with equity as a focus. And third, for the next steps, we need to test and implement evidence-based interventions to support client-centered care and promote, promote health equity for people with HIV and, and SDIs. So let's start with where we are. And this is the good news. We've seen demonstrable gains in viral suppression and linkage to care annually in Eastern and Southern Africa and in many other places. This is just one example between, uh, 20, and here, the, here are the data for 2017 to 2021. And I'll draw your attention to the teal color in each of these bar graphs with the proportion of people virally suppressed overall, and this is the proportion of adults increasing from 2017 to 2021, from about 60 to just over 70%. So we know that we are succeeding for a large number of people in achieving uh, viral suppression. But what is the gap between where we are today and where we want to be reaching the 95, 95, 95 targets and this figure shows the global HIV testing and treatment continuum of care for people living with HIV worldwide. And you can see here, we are at 84% of people living with HIV know their status, 73% are on treatment and 66% are virally suppressed. And as you know, the goals are 95, 95, 95, which gives us a product of 83% viral suppression overall. What are the gaps of that we need to meet in order to, in order to achieve these goals? So globally, there are 3.4 million people living with HIV who need to start treatment in order for us to reach the treatment goal and an additional 4.9 million people who need to achieve viral suppression in order to reach this goal. But let's ask ourselves, who are these people and what can we do in order to provide services that are accessible? And we know that gaps in viral suppression persist globally. I showed data for the world overall and um, data for Eastern and Southern Africa. Here are the data from the US where overall viral suppression in 2019 was 57% and 81% of people who are diagnosed with HIV are linked to care within a month of diagnosis, but attrition occurs over time. Just based on the data we looked at quickly, clinic-based care works for many facility-based services. But these gaps in viral, in viral suppression persist with these standard clinic-based services, particularly among men and priority populations. And barriers to clinic-based ART include logistics, wait time, and stigma. So let's now unpack the, unpack the group of people who are not yet virally suppressed as we want, as we plan to work in partnership with them and, and with, with services in order to achieve our ultimate goals for, for shared goals for health outcomes. 
So there is heterogeneity among those not linked and retained in care, and in particular, priority populations and people outside existing health care services have lower linkage and retention. And in this figure, I'm showing the differences in linkage and retention and viral suppression for children and adults. And you can see here in this um, mustard colored bar that for children at every stage, testing on treatment and viral suppression, there are significant gaps compared to adults. Also, when we look at gender and here in the teal bar, women and in the orange bar, men, you can see that there are persistent gaps in viral suppression with men generally less likely to test, less likely to initiate treatment and less likely to be virally suppressed. So these are gaps that we need to close with, with different types of strategies. I want to pause for a minute and look specifically at priority populations with high HIV prevalence, because we, these are the people who we need to engage in order to, uh, in order to increase both linkage and, and viral suppression. Among sex workers, HIV prevalence, and, and this is in Eastern and Southern Africa, was 33% among sexual minority men, 12.8% among people who use substances and here inject substances, 21% among transgender people, 28%, and among prisoners, 10%. And all of these are higher than adults in the general population, which was 6.2% for Eastern and Southern Africa. So how are we doing for viral suppression among these priority populations? And here are some data from South Africa for female sex workers and women in the general population. And you can see here in Cape Town, um, here in the, in the yellow bar, people who are virally suppressed uh, for women overall, viral suppression was higher than, than among female sex workers. When you look at Etiquini, it's, um, it's, it, there's still a difference, but the difference is less. But actually when you look at Johannesburg, viral suppression among uh, female sex workers is just slightly higher than women overall. So there definitely are methods that we can use in order to ensure viral suppression among priority populations and the general population. So we need to think and act differently. Let's start with the thinking part of it. Client-centered healthcare builds equity and meets people where they are. And I love this picture from, from Agnes, Agnes Maguire, who shows us very nicely in this illustration, the difference between equality and equity. And here in this figure, everyone is, has the same size box to try and look over the fence, but of course, everyone has different needs. And when we think, and that's equality, giving everyone the same type of service. But when we think about equity, we want to give people what they need in order to see over the fence. And here you can see a different distribution of the boxes, but there is equity, everyone can see over the fence. So this client-centered public health approach can build equity and we can, we can adapt to meet the needs of clients. There's a potential here for better outcomes at lower cost and also the potential to close those gaps in care that, I, that we started off by looking at first this morning. Differentiated, differentiated service delivery, DSD, is a client-centered approach that simplifies and adapts HIV services across the care continuum. And I want to draw your attention to the excellent work of the differentiated service delivery.org group, also part of IAS, where they talk about how you can use different building blocks in order to tailor services to meet the needs of clients. And so you can think about what is needed. So here, for example, ART refills could be done three monthly in the community by an expert client and a clinical consultation could happen annually at the, at the facility. And these DSD services have been adapted. And here are just a few examples and I'll, I'll walk through them because they all share the, the, the key concept of adapting services to meet clients where they are. So drop-in centers for sexual minority men in Ghana, community distribution points in Uganda, community-based points of AIT distribution and TB service integration in the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, community pharmacies for art refills in Nigeria, priority population organization-led ART delivery for transgender women in Thailand, P 
pediatric outreach with support in Zambia, integration of ART delivery into priority population services in Haiti, and community-based ART delivery for people who inject drugs in India. So community-based services shift service delivery and take services to people through active providers. In the next few slides, I will also show some examples that in addition to increasing retention in care, DSD can increase viral suppression and cost effectively avert HIV associated morbidity, mortality and transmission. In the introduction today, we heard all, that in addition to the individual and population level benefits of increasing retention in care and viral suppression, limiting transmission is, an, is also an important shared goal. Mm -hmm. And I want to share this example from the DUART study in Uganda and South Africa, where HIV prevalence is high and where there's a differential viral suppression among men and women. Participants in the study were randomized to one of three study groups, either clinic-based care or a hybrid group where they started care at the clinic and then received community-based services afterwards, or a community group in which participants receive their care entirely in the clinic. They initiate, sorry, entirely in the community. They initiated ART either at home or at mobile vans, and they received all their follow-up from, from mobile vans, including all their clinic, clinical monitoring. And overall, we found that viral suppression was highest in the community-based group, intermediate in the hybrid group, and lowest in the clinic group. For the comparison of community versus clinic, viral suppression was superior in the community group and non-inferior in the hybrid group. And through um, multiple um, sensitivity analyses, these results were robust. So community-based ART increased viral suppression. Very importantly, it also eliminated disparities in viral suppression by gender. And you can see that these disparities in viral suppression in the clinic group persisted between men in teal and women in brown here. But when you look at the community group, there, there was equity in, in viral suppression for by gender through community-based services. So we were able to achieve our goal here of equity. When we looked you know, using community, uh, using mathematical modeling, what the impacts would be, because the um, increase in viral suppression was marked for men, we could expect to see within five years, a 40% reduction in mortality for men, and also a 35% reduction in incidence for, for women. And this is the basic principle of U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. In addition, building on the math modeling and including costing, we were able to estimate that this was a highly cost-effective strategy at $210 per daily averted compared well below the threshold of 750. From the client's perspective, which is really the key for what is the, the mechanism for success of community-based interventions, flexibility, integration, efficiency, and a sense of a slower paced, overall increased engagement, and ultimately viral suppression. I wanted to also show that um, we are now in, uh, uh, now more than ever, at a time when we can think about how we can integrate technology. And in this study, um, in addition to using telemedicine and home delivery for antiretroviral therapy, therapy, we were able to use the same type of uh, software that. Um, th that companies use in order to ensure that every box for delivery is delivered on time. And here we use this, the software to deliver antiretroviral therapy. And what you are seeing here in this, in this video is the um, clinic here in the Red Cross. Each green dot is an individual. The size of the green dot shows the, how much ART is remaining for this individual living with HIV. And the algorithm can automatically determine the de delivery route depending on several variables, including client preferences for when, the, uh, when they are available to receive the medication. And every now and then you'll see a dot turn red indicating that their refills are at, at a very low level. And so then the algorithm can prioritize ensuring that they receive their, their ART on time. And this study also found superior um, viral, viral suppression 
And in this study, participants also paid for the delivery, and that was also very successful. 98% of participants paid for their delivery, uh, and viral suppression was, um, was superior and a relative increase of, of 21% compared to, the, compared to clinic. And just to highlight here that in using this client-based strategy, we were able to achieve the 95, 95, 95 goals for viral suppression. For the next steps, we need to test and implement evidence-based interventions to support client-centered care and promote health equity for people with, with HIV. And I want to draw your attention to the study HPTN094, which is a Vanguard study of health service delivery in a mobile using mobile health delivery units here in the US to link persons who inject drugs to integrated care and prevention for addiction, HIV, hepatitis C and primary care. And we're able to leverage data in the US based on HIV incidence. The darker color is higher incidence. And so we can really tailor services to meet the needs of clients. There are ample opportunities for integration and no talk on retention would be, co would be complete without mentioning the potential to integrate services. There's a lovely review that I want to draw your attention to, to by Dr. Bolstra, which shows that with integration of services, you actually have improved outcomes for, for all the health services. And, and I've listed here some additional in opportunities for integration. As we are drawing to the, the final slide, I want to share this very um, elegant study by Monica Gandhi and colleagues from San Francisco, where they looked at long-acting injectable ART delivered with comprehensive support services and found overall that it suppressed HIV viral load in people who are not virologically suppressed. So this study represented a change in the way we think about long-acting injectables. To date, it had only been offered to people who are virally suppressed on oral regimens. And in this figure, I'm showing the viral load for people who had detectable viral load. Um, everyone uh, ex uh, suppressed their viral load down to undetectable levels, except for these two individuals whose viral load decreased by, by two logs. And overall, participants in the study received, uh, achieved more than 96% viral suppression. There are many things to highlight from the study, but I want to just draw your attention to the multidisciplinary team. And uh, for clients who were served by this intervention, they, they reported high levels of substance use, marginal housing, and mental health needs. And these clients were not included in licensure trials for, 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 for these interventions. So what are we going to do next to ensure that we have good retention and care and viral suppression? We have to keep up the momentum for closing gaps and linkage to care and retention and focus on equity to meet people where they are and measure health outcomes. So I just I have these three messages to leave you with. We want to match techno technological advances, including long acting formulations with priority population needs especially through engagement with these with people in priority populations and empowerment of, of people in priority populations. We want to ensure that the global South and North con contribute to diverse clinical trial populations so that we make advances in real time for both of these groups. And then we want access in real time to evidence-based technologies for implementation and ongoing surveillance so we can continue to achieve our goals. Through person-centered person-centered care offers opportunities to close gaps in HIV in the HIV care continuum through engagement and partnership. With this focus on equity and on being client-centered, we can move from equality to equity to liberation and take down the wall in order to serve clients and meet their needs. I'll end with these three take-home points, but I will leave the last words of this presentation to the Smith and Son Frontier client who says. Simplify the way I get ARVs. I am tired of walking. I want to thank many people for their comments on these slides. And when we get to the discussion, I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ruan, for 
this wonderful presentation and, and, and thank you so much for highlighting the people-centered approach, uh, the use of DSD, including um, long-acting um, technology uh, to bring equity uh, for people then, then to, to get to achieve UA Coast through. Thank you so much. And um, now we will hear from um, Serena um, Kenick, uh, Senior Advisor to Geskio on challenges of linkage to care in low and middle income countries. Um, Serena, over to you. Thank you. And you're going to advance the slides, yes? Yes, we are. Okay. So um, Ruan just gave such a wonderful presentation of the global, um, the global approach to improving linkage retention and viral suppression with a focus on equity. And I am going to speak specifically about linkage to care and specifically from Haiti as a model for other low and middle income countries. I'll give a quick description of the Haitian group for the study of Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections, which is a, um, a clinic where I have been collaborating for almost 20 years. A quick description of the HIV care continuum, the importance of rapid ART initiation, the challenge of a, challenges of assessing for TB and other opportunistic infections at HIV diagnosis, and conclusions. Next slide. So JESCO is a Haitian non-governmental organization. It was founded and is led and entirely staffed by Haitian healthcare providers. It has a three-part mission of research to, to develop public health models, training, and clinical care. It's one of the largest HIV and TB centers in the Americas. It's a technical partner of the Ministry of Health and other local institutions. It has a very strong international collaboration for clinical care and research with continuous support from NIH since 1993. Next slide. So the HIV care continue, I'll just I think you know this, and Ruan just did such a brilliant job of going through this. Um, but as you saw um, on Ruan's slide, 3.4 million people know their status but are not on treatment. And that is uh, the group of people that I'll be talking about today. Next slide. So um, Dr. Bill Pop is the director of JESCIO. And uh, the focus that we've had at JESCO is how can we improve the care experience very early on? And I have always loved this quote, and this is his photograph. How can we roll out the red carpet for our patients on the day they receive their HIV diagnosis so they leave our clinic with hope and optimism that HIV is a treatable condition? Um, I also just wanna say, I'm talking about ART initiation on the facility level today, but we at JESCIO use a hybrid approach with community-based and differentiated follow-up care. Next slide. So same day ART initiation on the day of HIV diagnosis, this has gotten a lot of attention over the past several years. The goal is to reduce the barriers to ART initiation and improve linkage to care. There have been eight randomized trials that have assessed the impact of same-day ART on linkage to care and viral suppression. These have been conducted in Kenya, Lesotho, South Africa, and Haiti. Um, at JESCIO, we have conducted two of these studies. All studies found that ART initi initiation rates are higher with same-day ART. Four of these studies found higher rates of engagement in viral suppression, which persis persisted to at least one year. Four found no difference at one year. And these are quite complicated studies with different populations and different management of the standard group. Um, I will be telling you today about one of our studies from Haiti that showed higher rates of engagement and one that did not show a difference. Next slide. So here was our same day study number one. Uh, we started thinking about this issue of same-day ART back in 2009. We were delayed by the massive earthquake of 2010. And then shortly after uh, the earthquake and the, and the cholera outbreak, we really started to ask ourselves how we could improve HIV service delivery and what the experience would be like for a patient who came into the facility, waited in a long line to get an HIV test and received a result, and who knows how polite the person was who gave them result, the result or how welcoming. So we really started to think about what was the experience of the, of the client coming in to, to our clinic. 
Um, so we, at the time, this study was conducted a few years ago, and at the time, uh, standard was really about day 21, and this was faster at Jeskio than in many other sites. So we compared day zero, so you come in, you get an HIV test, and you start ART versus day 21. We gave very good care to both groups, in fact, equal care. And uh, Paul Farmer, who was my mentor until he tragically passed away last year, Paul Farmer said to me, please do not do a study where you compare good care in the intervention group and then bad care in the standard group. And uh, even Paul was very happy with how we laid this out so that all the patients got equal counseling sessions, equal phone calls, equal everything. We really just wanted to isolate the getting the ART on the day you come into the clinic versus having these delays for counseling and ruling out opportunistic infections. And as you can see, 12-month retention in care was 72% in the standard versus 80% in the same day. You would say, wow, that is really low for the same day group. That's pretty, pretty typical across um, most studies. However, we have improved that rate um, by improving uh, differentiated care delivery. Next slide. In terms of the primary outcome for this initial study, this, this population was, uh, were, was included patients with early HIV disease. So we, we didn't have, we weren't concerned about ruling out tuberculosis. These are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic patients. And if you look at the adjusted analysis, same day ART, we have a relative risk of 1.24. An entirely unexpected finding was that mortality during the study period was lower in the adjusted analysis in the same day group. And this was because patients who were lost very early in care, even with our great attempts to try to find them, but if they'd gone out to the countryside, it was very hard to locate them. And they were fragile patients and they died before we could bring them back to care. Next slide. So what about patients with TB symptoms at HIV diagnosis? So uh, same day ART is wonderful for um, patients with who, who you're not concerned about a coexisting opportunistic infection, but TB testing is necessary for patients with cough, fever, weight loss, or night sweats. Um, in brevity, I'll just tell you, it's very challenging to do expert uh, on the day of diagnosis, but our next study included a comparison of same day ART versus standard care for patients with a TB symptom. And our hypothesis was, you see this traffic, that's how we have to get these expert results across town to the lab. So we actually had a motorcycle driver standing by, patient came in, we, um, we did their counseling and if they had a TB symptom, we took their sputum specimen and then we had a motorcycle driver who drove across town to the lab and we got same day TB testing and the patients in the same day group left on day of HIV diagnosis with either tuberculosis treatment or antiretroviral therapy. And if they were diagnosed with tuberculosis, we started ART about two weeks later. The standard group, we, um, we, uh, we, we waited about one week to allow ourselves time to um, evaluate patients for tuberculosis. This next slide, I'll just skip over very quickly because it's just the study design. Oh, actually, this is the WHO, sorry, WHO guidelines. Um, so the WHO guidelines are very concerned about patients getting lost to care if they have tuberculosis so, or tuberculosis symptoms. So the first uh, 2017 same day guidelines came out and they said it, it, was, um, it was reasonable to do rapid ART to allow you for a uh, time for TB diagnosis. And uh, the, the WHO guidelines in March, 2021 were revised to say that patients living with HIV and signs and symptoms suggesting TB, if not meningitis, should initiate same day ART while rapidly investigating for TB with close follow-up if uh, the patient is diagnosed with TB. However, this is a major question right now. There are no good data on the safety of starting antiretroviral therapy when a patient has undiagnosed tuberculosis. Next slide. So here is the, the study I was just describing to you. And it's basically 
comparing the 2017 WHO guidelines with the 2021 WHO guidelines. So our standard group, we, we did rapid ART, but it was not same day ART because our, our goal really was to kind of work up the, you do the TB diagnosis, chest X-ray, expert, et cetera, but um, not to have the patient wait for all the test results. And then in the same day group, as I was saying, these, it was hard, it was very hard to try to get a same day TB evaluation. Um, but in the same day group, we did it. And uh, you can see here, the ART initiation in the standard group, if not diagnosed with TB, was day seven, and it was day zero in the same day group. Next slide. I also want to mention that while we were doing this study, there was a humanitarian crisis in Haiti. I will not go into detail for the purpose of time, but at the current point, Haiti is really approaching a civil war. This greatly complicated our ability to follow patients. Next slide. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of tuberculosis. Um, and in terms of community-based ART follow-up or ART initiation, this issue about tuberculosis is really important. I'll just draw your attention to the bottom line. Um, only 84% were not diagnosed with TB in one group and 808 in the other. So you know, you're talking 15 to 20% of patients have tuberculosis. Another point, um, among for patients diagnosed with bacteriologic TB, Jessica has got a brilliant uh, TB lab, and one expert was not sensitive enough to really effectively rule out tuberculosis. You can see with just one spot specimen, it picked up about two thirds, but then early morning, it picked up 72%. Um, and these are all with a comparison of culture positive. So just because somebody has one expert uh, ultra specimen even on the day of HIV testing and you send it to the lab, you will still miss uh, an important proportion of patients with tuberculosis. Next slide. So how did we do in this, in, this, uh, in this study I'm just telling you about among the patients with TB symptoms presentation? Every single patient started TB medication in both groups. 98% started in the standard group and 99.6% in the same day group. So really near universal initiation of TB medication and ART with either model, rapid or same day. Next slide. Uh, and I'm just going to draw, I know we're getting short on time, so I'm just going to draw really quickly, look at this retention in care. So we're up to 91.6% and 87.2%, so better than our first same-day study. And again, this, this study was conducted um, in, in a very challenging situation with gang violence in downtown Port-au-Prince. So with these faster models of care, differentiated model of care, um, patients really can be um, initiated and on treatment and retained in care. However, our primary outcome was viral suppression. And you can see we're still not at the targets where we wanna be, that top yellow bar. Um, this is very challenging. Ruan had some beautiful studies where she showed strategies where we can work on this. Um, all of the patients in our top line, some of them were not able to get a viral load and then many others were not suppressed. Uh, this is mainly because patients were not able to pick up their drugs on time due to the civil unrest. What has Jeskio done about this? Massive numbers of clinical, of a community-based ART sites throughout the city so patients can go to a safe location for ART. Next slide. Uh, this is my second to last slide. Just uh, one other point of what, what can we do? We need better TB risk assessment for same day ART. So this slide is an analysis we're working on right now where we're using different combinations of symptoms and C-reactive protein. That yellow bar is patients who did not have TB. And with this model of, of, of evaluating for TB, um, they, they're yellow because they all had to come back for an extra visit. They did not get same day ART and they didn't have TB. So the, this, this yellow bar, these are with all our strategies. These are patients who will still be delayed in starting ART. The green cross hatches are patients who did have TB and would have gotten appropriate treatment. They're looking at these different models of same day eligibility. And the red are patients who wouldn't have TB that you'd be missing. So um, if you look at the right, if you made everybody eligible, regardless of symptoms or CRP, which is the current WHO recommendation, you're gonna miss a substantial number of patients who do have active tuberculosis. 
On the other hand, if you look at the left side and you appropriately treat all those patients with TB by delaying them and starting their TB meds and then ART, you're going to have a very large number of patients who are unnecessarily delaying ART while you're evaluating them for TB. Uh, my final slide is coming. Uh, just in conclusion, rapid ART initiation has been broadly shown to Im improve linkage to care. We need to do better at fast evaluations and risk profiling for who does or doesn't have, who does or doesn't need to be evaluated for TB before ART. This is a very large number of patients. Other OIs can also present like TB and must also be considered, but the goal is to maximize ART initiation as well as future engagement in care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Serena. Um, next, um, we will hear about how Botswana has secured both national and international support to drive its achievement of the 95 targets. So I'm delighted to introduce Ava Avalos, um, who is a technical advisor to the Botswana National HIV Programme. Uh, Ava, great to see you and um, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the organizers again for including me on the round table. We're going to be touching on some of the areas that have led to Botswana's achievement of the 95-95 targets. You can turn the next slide um, and also talk a little bit about where we're headed in the future uh, with the focus on clinical care and, and therefore retention and care. So there were many, many different factors and thousands of people that have been working over these past uh, 22 years to get where we are. And we hope that um, some of the lessons that we've learned are, are helpful for you today. So next slide. I can't overstate the importance of the fact that from the beginning, Botswana has had full, full political support of the government. And since the beginning, the government has contributed over 65% um, of the finances that were required for the national HIV response. Um, you know, uh, the, His Excellency President Festus Mohai, who began the launch of the antiretroviral program, was a, a Rhodes Scholar in economics. And from the beginning, he made the investment case to parliament. And we've continued um, along that road always as we optimized treatment, making sure that it made economic sense and it we were able to um, convince uh, donor partners as well as the government to continue to optimize care. This allowed us also, when working with partners, to never have a double standard. So whatever was being used in the United States or in Europe, we also um, initiated in Botswana. So we always have had routine, HIV, uh, routine viral load testing, uh, resistance testing, we started test and treat, I think we were the first country on the continent, we were able to initiate uh, the latest uh, medications to, to treat people. Next slide. Also, we have had significant donor funding in the beginning from Merck and Gates, um, Chai, Pepfar, Myland, uh, Vive, and GSK also um, later in the epidemic, we've been able to really bring uh, donor partners together um, initially because Botswana had you know, the highest prevalence in the world. Botswana has, it will be the first uh, country with a generalized epidemic to reach the 95-95 target. So uh, the plea originally was from Festus Mahai at the UN you know, about 22 years ago that said, really, if we don't do this, we're gonna lose our country. So we've had many, many people come forward. We've also had strong research partners. So Botswana Harvard Partnership was there from the beginning. Baylor, that should have a Y in it. Um, Pediatric Center of Excellence, training physicians and nurses about pediatric care. UPenn, a strong TB partner, and of course, uh, the University of Botswana. So we've had um, really amazing support from really all around the world. Next slide. Also, we've had strong oversight of ART forecasting and procurement. We have something called the Drug and Costing Forecasting, uh, Costing Forecasting Technical Working Group. And this group um, consists of clinicians, um, uh, central medical stores, supply chain, development partners, and we meet monthly, and we've been doing this since 2010, to look at stocks, to consider um, if we, there was any issues with commodities, and to really make sure that all of the recommendations that we make in the clinical care guidelines are being able to be implemented on the ground, and it's been very successful. Next slide. 
So if we look at where we're at in 2022, and these were uh, figures from the UN GAM report, we've managed to decrease prevalence uh, across adults and children. We're almost, uh, we certainly will reach ep epidemiologic control by 2030. Uh, we have about 345,000 patients who are HIV positive uh, and our, our PMTCT, which just received UNAIDS silver status, um, has managed to get new births for children uh, infected to, low, to less than 200. So we're, we're very happy with this. Next slide. As far as the 95, 95, 95 targets go, you can see this uh, on the bottom in, in orange. Uh, we have managed to not only reach that goal for eligible adults for treatment, but also for the entire adult, adult population in Botswana with HIV, including non-nationals. So uh, again, we've been hard at work at this, um, but we're very satisfied. And so now we're able to shift our focus a little bit to our sustaining long-term care and how do we integrate um, a, a, in many aspects a, vertical, a verticalized program into primary care. Next. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, where we're headed as far as the clinical care guidelines are concerned, how we improve HIV prevention, and, you know, taking from um, our friends at um, ITPC who are global activists, you keep patients uh, in care by treating them right. And so this is, again, what we're hoping with the new guidelines will, will help to sustain the gains that we've made. Next slide. So to begin with, we'll be using fourth generation HIV testing. We're expanding uh, aspects of self-testing. We're really working on decreasing gender-based violence, which is something that is a, a very big issue in the country and intimate partner violence, and moving beyond definitions of key populations. Um, next slide. Not because we don't want to consider key populations, but we want to help and educate uh, patients and community about who are really at risk. Right, so in addition to the key populations we've been working with, talking about uh, how you determine what is your risk for HIV acquisition. So um, we want to make sure that uh, middle-aged married women understand their risk as well as adolescent young uh, girls and women. Next slide. Also, how one does sex, really, to be able to talk about, are you engaged in these kinds of behaviors if you are you know, come and see us so that we can provide prep or understand really what your risk is so you can make decisions um, that are in your best interest. Next slide. We're also expanding and improving prep. We have endorsed long-term injectable cabotegravir once it becomes globally affordable. Uh, it's available, um, it, it isn't available in the public yet, but the government has okayed that. We're expanding the use of prep for pregnancy, for HIV uh, negative women in pregnancy, and we're implementing uh, event-driven prep for MSM. Go ahead. As far as optimizing heart is concerned, we're switching our first line to TAP-DD. Our second line will be Duravarine and Darunavir Ritonavir. And I think the most exciting thing about the new guidelines is that we will be switching clinically stable patients um, from TLD-based regimens to dual therapy, 3TC, DTG, uh, to avoid long-term to toxicities. Uh, and again, once long-term injectables become affordable, we will do our best to implement them in the public sector and we continue to expand the use of DTG in children. Next slide. So this is a slide that talks about a study that was completed in, in 2019 that showed that patients that arrived for initiation with CD4 counts less than 200, 76% of them had already been in care. And we're certainly seeing this you know, globally, but very much so in Botswana, with the patients that come in with advanced disease have defaulted from treatment. And so uh, this has initiated our advanced HIV care initiative uh, so that we can make sure that patients that are ill and patients who have low CD4 counts go into a higher level of care um, and are treated correctly with the screening tools that are necessary. The next slide, please. So we have new failure management protocols. Again, we've um, optimized our highly treatment experienced patients of which we, even 20 years later, we don't have so many. We're introducing a 30-day directly observed DOT for patients who um, present with viremias on DTG-based regimens. 
uh, in order to make sure that resistance testing that takes place actually shows something on the results. Next slide. And again, we have an emphasis on advanced HIV care. So as soon as we find out that we have baseline uh, CD4 count, and if, again, if baseline CD4 counts are not available at initiation, we make sure that they get them within three days and patients are screened with all of these different interventions so that we can make sure that um, we can begin to decrease the mortality in advanced HIV uh, care patients. Still, mortality is highest in the three months um, after starting initiation. So this has been a really important initiative that has been supported uh, by CHAI very generously and also has been supported by BUMI. So I think that um, we are going to hopefully see a decrease in mortality as well. Next slide. We're also emphasizing diet, nutrition, and exercise and really lifestyle changes. And this is because we are seeing a wave of comorbidities that um, is at times frightening um, and trying to educate patients about how to prevent hypertension, cardiovascular disease, um, and it's a, it's a challenge because many of our patients are poor. It, it is expensive to buy vegetables. Um, it is expensive uh, to not eat junk food. So really trying in, um, in to be as innovative as possible about educating patients about cooking and, um, and prevention, um, uh, uh, really. And as well, um, another really important area is expanding availability of contraception. Uh, we still have a very high maternal mortality rate, which has a lot to do with young women who get pregnant using condoms and then um, have failed abortions. So we're really trying to push and educate the population that condoms are not contraception. Uh, we also have new algorithms for cryptococcal meningitis, um, new algorithms for the treatment of hypertension and cardiovascular disease. We will be transitioning to shorter month four-month treatment for tuberculosis, and we've expanded the use of 3-HP for TPT. So um, I think that what's really important, uh, just finally, is saying that integration is fundamental. And even as we're trying to decide what new implementation, um, what new, new methods of implementation for HIV um, uh, care are important, we have to think about the rest of the healthcare system. So, you know, if, if we're having issues with, again, taking care of basic patient needs like hypertension or cancer, uh, we have to begin to think about sharing our resources from HIV across a very uh, weak and tired healthcare system in general. I'm sure we'll be talking more about that um, through the panel discussion. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Eva, for, for that um, beautiful talk. Um, and now um, we will um, hear another case study on the Elizabeth Glazer's uh, Pediatric AIDS Foundation's Red Carpet Program in Kenya by Job um, Odoyans Okuno. Uh, Job, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're glad to share uh, this as a case study. And uh, if you can give me the next slide. Yeah, so Red Carpet essentially was um, designed uh, to meet the needs of the adolescents, um, both girls and boys, and um, this uh, disaggregated uh, by the age bands of 10 to 14, 15 to 19, and later on expanded to include uh, the 20 to 24 year olds. And this was informed by the suboptimal linkage um, and retention in care among these adolescents and young persons, um, leading to their negative outcomes um, while on care. And um, a, a greater point was that um, despite marked improvements in adult care, including viral suppression, this population still had um, suboptimal viral suppression. So the red carpet therefore was um, designed so that it could actually see that we have early identification, which means that efforts were made to also ensure that the young people are getting to know their status and, and then they are uh, linked early to uh, care and they are retained and supported throughout uh, that journey. Next. 
So when you look at the red carpet, essentially the red carpet uh, builds on um, working with a number of stakeholders uh, to be able to provide the quality of care for the young people and that it looks at the, the uh, outcomes uh, for young people beyond health so that you have a base where the young people have one, the red carpet health facility, which is where the services are provided and that there is um, a set of, of uh, conditions that we set out for the facilities. Then there was the element of um, the red carpet responsive community and schools where we are looking at what is it that's happening at the social level in the community as well as in the schools to be able to either remove the barriers that the adolescents were receiving or empower the community and school uh, stakeholders to be able to be more supportive to the adolescents um, and young persons in care. And largely then working with the uh, stakeholders that um, relate with the young people at the various levels to ensure that they get the necessary support uh, to be able to um, stay and get uh, into uh, some of the services. So in terms of the program elements, we are looking at what we call the fast track access uh, to services, including the reduction of barriers for these adolescents and young persons living with HIV. And when um, uh, Serena opened her presentation, she began by talking about a red carpet um, a treatment for persons living with HIV. And therefore, the design of this program was actually that the young people living with HIV are seen as very important persons. And therefore, their experiences through the health facility was made facil uh, very facilitative, navigated uh, through their peer champions, and supported beyond the facilities to be able to have that environment in their schools. And lastly, of course, uh, strengthening the bidirectional referral between the health facility and the other community, um, including the school, to be able to be more responsive to the needs of these young people, as I will illustrate as we go along. Next slide. So what I mentioned earlier that we are talking about a, v, a VIP experience, and therefore for us to be able to um, provide that service, we needed to define what would be a VIP experience for the young person at the facility? So we then designed a VIP express desk where all young persons coming into the facility are channeled to a VIP express desk where there is a peer champion who is themselves a young person on care who has been trained and, and equipped to be able to help uh, understand what the needs of the young people are. And then the VIP Express Health Room is where we have a healthcare worker who's been trained to be able to respond to the needs of the young people to understand how young people want to be treated. And therefore they offer a one-stop shop for, for the young persons who come for, to the facility for these services. And to make sure that you know it's easy for them to identify themselves as VIPs, we designed with them the red carpet VIP express card, which is a card that um, they use to identify themselves. And when the health, health facility uh, staff saw the VIP express card, they ensured that the, the young people got their fast track uh, services. We also ensured that there was a feedback mechanism where the young people are able to give us feedback so that we can continually improve the quality of care and that there was a fast track essential uh, package of services that was defined so that when young people come in, you know, right from screening as well as other services, including, you know, um, what they could do, uh, what services they could uh, be provided at every visit um, so that the healthcare workers were also able to track and see whether they were delivering those services. And then there was the adherence and support tools to be able to document that and that there was a communication. And on my left is that card, which we call the red carpet VIP express card that young people used to come to the facility. Next slide. So from the uh, design, this was a youth driven model, um, both in terms of what happened in the community as well as what happened within the, the, the health facility. So we engage the young people to be able to help design how they, the red carpet uh, program would look like, what kind of tools will be in place, what kind of evaluation questions and everything that we needed. 
we also using our meaningful youth engagement uh, standards we were also able to identify what capacity gaps the young people had so that they could be trained including in areas of, of advocacy to be able to champion the interests of other young people so that they have um, improved engagement with their, their caregivers, but also that they are, they are enabled to uh, get the support at every point. Then we also had committees at the facility level, sub-county and county levels where the adolescent and youth peer advisory groups, APACs, uh, were helping give in, uh, feedback to the caregivers at facility, but also the other stakeholders at, at the uh, various above site level. Next. So what therefore um, did we see when we put in place the red carpet uh, model in place in terms of the linkage and retention among the adolescents and young persons? Next slide. So um, beginning to look at the screening of adolescents accessing various services and referring them for HIV testing services meant that we could see that a number of young people would have been missed uh, were then identified early enough and um, uh, referred appropriately for H HIV testing services. Again, in terms of um, the navigation process, we are able to see same day hand in hand linkage or physically escorted um, you know, young people getting the necessary services they needed in terms of prevention, care, and treatment. And that that was largely done by the peer champions who helped the young people to navigate the complex healthcare system. And that we also ensured there was proactive follow-up. So instead of waiting for the young people to default and call them, we were able to do reminders before their appointment dates and follow them up either with phone calls if they had, because we had also taken, uh, you know, their, their their phone records and everything as well as locator information for those who needed uh, to be visited as ho at home. Um, in cases where we had challenges, especially with schools, we were also able to have the same uh, peer team plus some cases where we had multidisciplinary teams also visiting um, households or visiting schools to be able to either address some of those barriers or just um, encourage the young people uh, to come for their scheduled or unscheduled appointments as it were. And then the approach being that it was multidisciplinary. Everyone in the facility, starting with the, the security person at, at the gate knew that when a young person came into the facility, this was the kind of services that they needed. And this was a kind of, of, of process that they needed. And therefore everyone was supportive in the process in ensuring that that was done. The bi-directional coordination ensured that we actually had focal persons in the schools who are actually responsible for supporting these learners who are living with HIV in school, but also working closely with a healthcare provider that worked within the VIP uh, room to be able to ensure that they were supporting these learners to um, uh, stay on care. And then um, just the adherent support in school as well as additional uh, psychosocial support services. So with that, therefore, um, the VIP express services reduce their time for waiting, uh, ensure that they, are, they, are, they, are, they, they had navigation support to ensure that um, you know, they received the, the services they needed without a lot of hindrance. The one-stop shop ensured that um, you know, that one trained provider could either provide that service or bring on board whoever else that was needed for any of the services. Hence, a young person didn't have to move from six or so different service delivery points to get the quality of care. And of course, I've talked about how the peer-driven communication supported this process. Next. So in terms of the evolution, it is important just to note that the red carpet project was initially designed um, in the uh, US, but later when we did the adaptation for the Kenyan context, we ensured that in 2016, there was a meaningful engagement of the adolescents right from the design to the evaluation of the study, part of which we will share with you. And that then we proceeded to pilot this intervention in Kenya with impressive um, outcomes leading to a national scale up, including you know, um, some of the recommendations that went into the development of the national 
um, uh, 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 guidelines to support learners living with HIV in schools. And then um, the project was scaled up uh, through uh, 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 our Malawi uh, country program. And currently, uh, based on also what, what happened within the Malawi context, the country program with the CDC support uh, has also been able to integrate the red carpet within the CDC award. And uh, as of 2023, we are actually seeing um, the project being scaled up in uh, Lesotho as, uh, as, uh, as of now. Next slide. So based on this, it's just um, important that I, I share some uh, key results. Um, when we began the pilot, what we saw that pre-intervention, we actually had uh, um, retention at three months at 66%, uh, but the post-intervention, we saw this rising to 90%. And at six months, this improved from 54% to 98.6%. Uh, Therefore, there was a significant improvement in linkage to early retention in care among adolescents and youth within Homer Bay, Kenya. And because of that, therefore, when we engaged with the partner Aviv, we were therefore able to scale this to uh, other counties, including um, uh, part of the semi-arid uh, parts of this country to see how different that would be. And um, next slide. We therefore uh, could see that from the, the project way back from the lessons we learned in 2016, in, in April 2020 to December 2021, we actually now set up just to create um, three centers of excellence where other partners could actually also come and learn how the intervention was working. And in these three centers, we enrolled 706 adolescents and youth living with HIV and the retention at three months among the adolescents and the young persons living with HIV across the, the three centers of excellence was 84% and retention at six months across these sites was 88%. And of course that was largely because during that period we also had the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, 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 lockdowns which also affected a bit of uptake of services. But overall, we did also see a significant improvement with a 96% viral road suppression um, compared to the national average at the time of 61.4% for adolescents between the ages of 10 to 19. Next slide. So in, in a young person's world who was um, involved in the program as a youth uh, champion, he did indicate that the introduction of the peer champions uh, within the facility has really helped to maintain the linkage because they really share a lot and also the opening up of the peer champions to the other newly enrolled uh, uh, young people really motivates the other uh, ones and he or she is not the only one. And this is a joint thing and there is a life after being positive. So we could also see that the young people themselves were appreciating the fact that having their peers helping them navigate this, the process as well as just sharing their experience was motivating enough for them and it was part of the successes for the red carpet uh, intervention. Next. Um, so when you look at the red carpet um, as we did the scale up in, in uh, Malawi, we also did note that um, from the four sites where we did a baseline, just look at how the sites were performing, you know, identified, you know, um, uh, low uh, 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 testing, low uh, viral suppression and the like. We therefore did um, invest in working with the uh, Malawi program to be able to train the peer champions, to be able to train and reorient the healthcare workers. And within um, the period we did see an 8% HIV uh, testing yield. We did see a 99% um, of the um, adolescents and young persons linked to ART and the six months retention improved significantly from 32% um, a percent, uh, from baseline to 55% uh, in December, 2019. And by July, 2021, it was at 87%. The viral load coverage um, which was low at 60% improved to 100% uh, 
um, us at the end of um, September 2021. Next. So from the, the results um, uh, that we did see, additionally, 73% um, of the adolescents and young persons were retained at the RCP sites at three months compared to 62 um, in some of the other sites where we're working as control and 81% 80, retention among the adolescents and young persons living with HIV at six months compared to 69% respectively after ART initiation. And feedback from you know, the young persons who are experiencing the services of the red carpet is that I highly appreciate our doctors together with our adults and peers for the care and concern they've shown they've been showing us. They have been treating us as well, um, treating us well as per our expectations. We request our health workers to continue loving, advising, and sharing ideas, more so the adolescents sharing problems they have been going through and finding out their solutions. Uh, to sort the problems out. Next. So based on what we've seen, we therefore uh, consider some of the best practices and, and lessons learned as that the inclusion of youth champions as part of the red carpet response, working together with the multidisciplinary team allows for uh, you know, improved uh, flow for, for clients as well as timely access to the services. Uh, two, is that equipping and empowering youth champions in their role supports them to identify and link eligible young people from different um, service delivery points for testing, leading to improved testing rates and higher yield. And of course, it's important to note that, you know, um, young people may come for different services, but because of the presence of peer champions at the facilities, what every healthcare worker does is any young person is actually linked to a peer champion at the facility who then helps to identify whether they know their HIV status and the like and helping them to um, find the services. The third one is that the development of adolescents and youth tailored documentation systems supported us to be able to document, you know, the experiences as well as working with existing tools to ensure that the services for this population is best coordinated and that the structured documentation of these services. And of course, as you remember, some initially some of the challenges uh, in most countries were that data was not disaggregated by some of these uh, subpopulations. The um, fourth one is that the involvement of young people at every stage of this uh, design up to implementation and evaluation ensures that the programs, um, you know, uh, outcomes and impacts a long lasting and we continue to see that even after the end of this project in this country. Um, the fifth lesson is that the coordinated efforts um, in, in terms of working with multiple stakeholders, more importantly, the Ministry of Education ensures that learners living with HIV are supported within those institutions, but also for community that we are also able to ensure that those young people who are in boarding schools do not go through some of the uh, traumatizing experience when they go to boarding schools. And lastly, that the focus of the multidisciplinary team ensures that there is proactive case management, that there is follow up with these young people to come to the facility, and therefore there's early and prompt engagement of, of the adolescents and young persons in care, and that their additional needs are also met through the various team uh, members. Next, we thank everyone for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, Job, and uh, particularly um, passionate about this one, um, having actually worked with the EGPAF team back in 2016 when the pilot was set up in Kenya. So uh, phenomenal yeah. to see where that program has gone. So thank you for sharing that, that very specific and clear um, activity. Um, our last present presenter today, um, before we go into the panel discussion, is Leon Essink uh, from the AIDS Funds. And Leon uh, is a senior project officer there, and he's going to talk to us about digital solutions to improve linkage and access to care. Over to you, Leon. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Helen. Uh, so, yes, my name is Leon, and I'm involved uh, in a few of our AIDS Funds projects. Uh, and I'm going to tell you today more about our step care model for sexual reproductive health. 
uh, with def which definitely includes also uh, yeah, increasing access and linkage to care, uh, but also uh, retention to care. Uh, apart from that, I'm also involved in a Tandiso approach project in which um, an, uh, a mobile app has been co-created with young people in Malawi. We work together with the Coalition of Women Living with HIV in Malawi on this project. And now I realize that that might have e maybe even better fitted this, uh, this session uh, because it's really about uh, retention to care. I will post a link uh, to the pr project page in the app if you want to of in the chat if you uh, wish to have a look um because i'm not i don't have sufficient time uh today to also tell you about um about this project uh so i'll focus on the step care uh project um uh, next slide please um uh, that changed a little i see uh but no problem uh so first a little bit about aids funds um, so we are an organization established in 1985 by a group of gay men uh, who want to do something for their friends dying of AIDS. And uh, they started funding uh, Christmas hampers uh, to, to support uh, their peers. Uh, and out of this, uh, they grew an uh, organization that we are today. Uh, so we have about 160 staff uh, working uh, nationally in the Netherlands, uh, as well as internationally. And our vision is a world in which uh, everyone can freely love and, and without fear. And we do that uh, by working on three goals, uh, three of our dream goals. And that is that no one dies of AIDS, uh, no new HIV infections, uh, sexual and reproductive health for all, and a cure available for people living with HIV. Uh, we do this, for example, by providing over 500 community grants to do advocacy, capacity strengthening, and community service delivery. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and we really try to work together with uh, with communities. So we also make sure, um, or we have the ambition that in all our work, uh, community co-decide on our funding. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, here you see an overview of uh, our focus countries, and these um, yeah have been picked based on HIV incident incidents, but also where we could make the biggest impact and we where we have a track record. Uh, so you see ten focus countries, but also a few regions in, in which we work. For example, uh, yeah, we have a lot of work currently uh, in Ukraine with the rising number of HIV infections, but also yeah the war there going on. Um, next slide, please. Um, then now I'm going to move to uh, Stepped Care. Uh, Stepped Care is the biggest uh, digital health project, uh, and it's all about making sure that young people uh, have access to the right information and services at the right place in the right time, uh, delivered by the right digital solution or person to meet their specific needs. Uh, so it really looks at uh, uh, yeah, digital and non-digital health from a system health systems approach. And in the next slide, I'm going to uh, show you a little presentation uh, to give you an idea about how this works. Yes. What if we revolutionize sexual and reproductive health services for young people? 400 million youth worldwide have limited access to sexual and reproductive health services. And today's digital health solutions, they often only address one aspect of health, suffer from pilotitis, or simply don't meet young people's needs. Moreover, a lack of collaboration among donors and implementers leads to unsustainable and isolated solutions. What can be done? The stepped care model for sexual and reproductive health is a robust digital health ecosystem, facilitating collaboration among stakeholders. Stepped care responds by putting young people at the center. It integrates offline and online services for young people. Services that are non-judgmental, age-appropriate, and sex-positive. Delivered just the way young people like it. How does it work? A web-based platform offers general health information. Chatbots and interactive games provide automated online advice. For personal counseling, youth can talk on a helpline or over chat and email. Talk to a healthcare professional or see a medical doctor. As users move through the model, they're referred to services at higher or lower steps. The lower the step, the higher the reach in self-care, and the lower the cost of services. Yes, thank you very much. Go to the next slide, please. 
So I hope this video gives you a little bit of an idea of how the step care model uh, works and can work in, in practice. It's of course different in every context. Um, and uh, the model really acknowledged that there's no single solution for all young people uh, because young people are very different. Uh, they have different kind of issues and problems, uh, different kind of information needs, and also very much different preferences in what, how they would like their needs, net, uh, needs met. And we already saw in, in previous presentations about differentiated service delivery, for example. Yeah, some young people uh, have no problem in visiting a health center. Uh, others would prefer to have that treatment uh, um, brought to them at home. Uh, so that's also really yeah how the step, step care model acknowledged that uh, young people have different preferences and that they also should have different um, uh, ways in how they could access um, information as well as services. Um, and yeah, we also see that yeah, digital health really has the potential to complement uh, traditional services uh, that inadequately address uh, the needs. Uh, because we see that young people, uh, yeah, more and more people nowadays have access to internet, uh, have a mobile phone, and uh, yeah, simple questions, uh, but also stories can easily, uh, yeah, digitalize so that young people have access to these online. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but what we also really see is that a coordinated approach is needed. Uh, we see a fragmented digital health intervention landscape uh, where. Yeah, also big INGOs do their own thing, own thing um, and that investments in digital health are often uh, siloed. So there are sometimes, uh, yeah, for example, in a country we have mapped uh, uh, different interventions, digital health interventions, and we found four different websites that provide uh, information about HIV and SRHR. Uh, and on these, on these websites, all were a service finder, like a, a map, uh, with services mapped. And when we looked at these different maps, we saw that for the same countries, these uh, the services in these maps were all different. So yeah, you can imagine being a young person ending up at a website and there's no services nearby mapped in this uh, in, in this this on this website. Well, there is actually a website that uh, does have services mapped nearby. Uh, so not an ideal situation. Um, Apart from that, we also see that interventions fail to scale up. Uh, so it's often underestimated, for example, to develop a new chatbot uh, to, to support uh, young people with, with their questions and needs. Uh, but the, the maintenance costs, uh, but also uh, the updating with new content, etc., is often underestimated. So uh, often interventions fail to scale up or even sustain. Um, and yeah, we see that there's a lack uh, of collaboration and that this makes that yeah that that uh, services are often very fragmented uh it's hard for young people to navigate uh to this to through the wide variety of services and also to know like what services are reliable uh, and which ones not because it's hard yeah uh, to build a trusted brand if you're just an organization and in partnership we see that is uh that that is best better possible so if we go to the next slide so yeah, the step care model um, has been developed uh, in the in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, over twelve years ago uh, there were also multiple websites uh, developed by uh, our organization, uh, but also another NGO, uh, community health services, all targeting young people with information about uh, HIV and SRHR. Uh, and, and access to services. Um, at that time also, uh, yeah, we saw that that's not an ideal in, in, uh, situation and together with the government, um, uh, the, the new, yeah, a new Europe brand uh, called Sense was developed in which different organizations and the government and community health services uh, work together uh, under one brand. Um, and uh, yeah, this uh, uh, is all based on the step care model. And uh, now this is also implemented in uh, South Africa, where we work together with the National Department of Health and different stakeholders, uh, Kenya, uh, in Mozambique and in Indonesia. And the step care model you use to map out different uh, services that are there. So you could bring stakeholders together, map what service do, does each of the stakeholders have. Uh, so that you can find gaps, but also uh, look at different health 
journeys uh, through every step. So for example, a journey on mental health, uh, a journey on uh, HIV, uh, but also a journey living with HIV. So inv involving young people living with HIV to make sure they have the right information on the website. They have maybe a chatbot or an online tool that supports them. Uh, uh, they can call a helpline service that know how to support young people living with HIV uh, and, and seek health advice or medical consultation if needed. So you make sure that you look at each step, uh, if there are services available, if they have the right quality, but also that if they are linked uh, with each other and then therewith supporting different uh, yeah, needs of young people uh, comprehensively. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, how do we work with coalition, uh, with these coalitions? Um, so in these countries, there's different coalitions of stakeholders and governments. And uh, yeah, based on the experience from the Netherlands from the past uh, of 10 years, uh, we support with a range of uh, uh, yeah things like the StepCare model. Uh, we have launched the StepCare guideline for implementation last year, which is freely available on our website. Um, uh, which includes also a discovery workshop where they just talk about mapping the services and see where has the gap and overlap, how to effectively work together, uh, and a range of uh, uh, technical support. Um, we can go to the next slide. I think I'm going to skip this one because of time. And then I think the final slide. Um, yeah, so some successes we had is, uh, yeah, I've already mentioned the, the step care guideline. Uh, uh, Fibra Choice uh, in Mozambique, uh, there wasn't a website with information on SRHR, HIV, love, sexuality yet. Uh, so that has been developed by a coalition of partners and launched uh, last year, Valentine's Day. And really exciting, uh, in two weeks time, there uh, uh, will be a step uh, discovery workshop in which we expect about 30 participants, amongst which the government and major Mozambican and international organizations uh, to take place to, uh, to map out uh, the services that are there and look at who can contribute to, uh, to which gaps. Um, so on the, on, the, on the picture, you see how that worked in Indonesia. Uh, you see on the post-its, they have on every step, uh, mapped out what services uh, uh, are are available uh, on every step. Um, so that uh, that happened last year in Indonesia, where the step care model was adopted. Um, in B wise, um, yeah, we new services joined the coalition. Uh, new uh, partners joined the coalition, like UNICEF, uh, who is uh, developing a, a pathway on pregnancy or strengthening it. Elton John AIDS Foundation and Heartlines, uh, who. Uh, develops content on mental health. Um, and yeah, this brings us to the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Leon. Um, yeah, there's, there's been such a, a huge number of rich presentations. So hopefully lots of um, stimulus for thought and ideas uh, for the discussion that we will now head into. Um, so um, myself and Nataya will will take us through this, but um, I'd like to uh, take a moment to just introduce and welcome our panelists for today. Um, so this is going to sort of go into a more conversational piece around what more can we do looking forward um, to, to improve that linkage to care? I think we've seen some best case um, you know, uh, examples, but how, how do we do more and, and what is it that's sort of underpinning the success of those models that have worked? So I'd like to invite uh, Christopher Hoffman, um, Serena Koenig, uh, Todd Polak, uh, Immaculate Owa Mugisha, hopefully I have pronounced your name appropriately, and uh, Mopauli Das from, from uh, as well to join. And just as you all uh, turn your cameras on and your speakers, um, just a quick uh, intro so you know where the panelists are, are joining us from. Um, so Christopher is an associate professor at the School of Medicine at John Hopkins. Um, Serena, who we have uh, heard from this morning, um, this afternoon, is the associate professor of medicine at Harvard. Um, Todd is the assistant professor of medicine also at Harvard. Uh, Immaculate is a Ugandan lawyer and human rights advocate and member of the HIV Justice Network Supervisory Board. And then lastly, uh, Malpali is, is from 
Gilead um, bringing that industry voice to the panel discussion. So welcome. And um, I hope you are all um, ready for this discussion. And obviously building on the first round table that we had that was focused on the testing and the diagnosis that first 95 and how do we improve that collectively as a sector today's focus is the next step and beyond that diagnosis uh, diagnosis stage how do we really encourage um, people who test positive to link to care and then ultimately stay in care we know from that conversation um, that a one size does not fit all. And I think that's been um, you know, really clear again from the presentations that we have seen this morning, where it's been great to delve into different populations, different geographical settings and see how different approaches have really been what has driven results. And that really differentiated care approach really matters. So I think what Maybe to start off, it would be nice to link the two round tables together. And so the question that I have is around, can the fragmented testing services ultimately set us up for failure when it comes to linkage to care? And how do we you know, make that linkage? How do we ensure that effective linkage from a very wide range of testing service, which we learn is important, how do we make that happen to then pull through the benefit of that approach to testing through to linkage um, and, and retention and care. I know there's some examples here um, through partnerships. So I'm going to ask Ava and um, Mo Pauli initially to, to respond to this. I don't know, Ava, if you are still with us. I'm sorry, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that question. Um... So it's been really interesting, you know, again, as you just said, listening to, you know, the, the different different models. In, and in many ways, Botswana is quite a medicalized model. And as I said before, it's quite verticalized and it's been very successful. Um, but as far as sustainability is concerned, you know, now we really have to provide choice and provide choice that is, you know, affordable and sustainable. And I think that's, you know, that's really, what we need to be doing more is implementation science. So we need to be able to actually look at, you know, the results and get feedback from the community and, and hear what it is that, um, what works best for them. You know, Botswana has, when the epidemic hit, Botswana had an established healthcare system. It was in place. So that's why it was very easy to roll out. We, we already had something there. And also it's a beneficent government. People trust the government here. People, you know, I, I came from Los Angeles and a medical doctor into Botswana was like, you know, pe people actually respect what doctors say and do what they say. It's wonderful and amazing to be a doctor here, right? So it's just being able to say, okay, again, where are we missing implementation science? What, where, can we, where, where can we fill in the gaps? I guess that's the short answer. Thanks, Ava. Um, and Mo Parley, maybe perhaps you can talk from an industry lens around the role of industry partnerships and opportunities around trying to sort of help support, drive and, and, and create new ways of linking to care. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And I wanted to just say hello to everyone and thank IAS and the ILF for the opportunity to speak. And um, my name is Mopali Das and I'm an ID doctor and HIV um, clinical trials researcher. And I've worked in um, the field of HIV um, from a public health and academic medicine perspective and at Gilead for the last 10 years. So I'll be drawing on all those experiences in my answer. Um, and I think the, the three real priorities are partnerships, people, and pipeline. And if we focus on partnerships in this question, really taking everything that we've learned over the last two and a half decades and applying it currently to what we have and what we're developing for the future. And in terms of testing and linkage to care, I think the first thing we have to think about is who's being diagnosed late and why? Why are there delays in testing? And how do we ensure that those folks are properly linked and engaged in care? And I think 
you can think about it as two ends of the spectrum. One end is people who may not identify as someone who might acquire HIV, people who don't recognize their own factors. And in that situation, or people who have competing priorities, they have other things in their lives that are way more important, like housing or job security or food security, rather than an HIV test. And so I think if we think about one very fractured testing system, which is the United States, um, one of the ways that I think uh, we and our partners have approached that is to think about routine opt-out testing in emergency departments, because many people use emergency departments as a fail-safe way and as a safety net for their other competing priorities and other healthcare situations. So one of the things that we've done um, in terms of an industry perspective is we have a program that's a 10-year, $100 million commitment to the Southeastern United States and really working with um, emergency rooms and, uh, sorry, that program is working with community-based organizations to meet people where they're at and for people who are not identifying them, themselves at having a factor for HIV acquisition, we're screening um, for uh, HIV, as well as other syndemic conditions in emergency rooms. And that can catch people on that one end of people who don't identify as risk, who might be presenting to the health department for another condition. And then working with non-traditional partners for people who, um, for stigma reasons, may not present to an HIV testing organization, whether that's barbershops, hair salons, nail salons, churches or organizations that work, for example, with formerly incarcerated persons or people who inject drugs. So really looking at who's being diagnosed late and who's having challenges linking to care and trying to go where those folks are. And that might be the emergency room, that might be the barbershop on the corner, and really trying to uh, use those partnerships um, with trusted providers and places people trust to address uh, challenges with testing and linkage to care. Thank you. Thank you. Great to hear. And I think what's really important and great about today's discussion is, is the breadth of um, topics and geographies that we're seeing examples from, because I think there is a lot to learn um, to global from global north to global south. I'm going to ask uh, Immaculate, obviously, um, from your experience from a community lens and, and from, I guess, that legal justice lens, um, I don't know if there's any reflections um, from, from your perspective around um, on how those elements play into both, you know, the, the ability or uh, acceptability of um, linkage and, and access to care. Yes, um, thank you so much. And um, allow me to appreciate the, the previous presenters for the great presentation and uh, really for giving us broad perspective on what is happening across the globe and what models are working and um, how we are continuing to see the results. We we'll continue to see the results um, on the work and the models that are being work, are being implemented in the different uh, parts of the world. Um, but for me, as the presentations really were going on, the, the, the key questions uh, kept coming in my mind and I kept having reflection indeed as a community, um, as a person who is really uh, supporting the community at grassroots in different levels. Yes, uh, we really appreciate and applaud that different models are working. We know the peer model um, is working, age-friendly services are working, but the question is, how are we going to sustain this? Is it, are we, are we going to sustain it? We are seeing that um, most of these interventions, very good interventions, well intended, our partners come and go, but when they go, do we have the, the, the willingness from the government to take on these well um, invested in models that work for the community? I think we remain with the gap there on the sustainability part. And I think it is a conversation of how do we start integrate or integrate these um, models into, into the government programming without interrupting the, the sense of working with the communities, because sometimes governments can be challenging on how they want to work with communities, civil society, and CBOs at different grassroots level. Then secondly, is in the issue of how are we involved in communities what we call the community-led monitoring. 
HEPFA has invested so much in community led monitoring. We see results, we see communities um, monitor and track who are those who have missed out the, their refills, who um, they lost follow ups. We are seeing community take very proactive action in monitoring the, the, the service delivered at grassroots. And we see this information feed so well into what government is tracking. And I think for me, that, that as we, we integrate the different models of bringing services and ensuring that we retain um, clients into care, is are we, can we also strongly empower the communities to monitor and ensure that there is retention at that level and use that information to form uh, programming at government level. Um, community drug delivery model is a great approach, but I think it has less investment. Um, we saw it work in COVID time. Many people were stuck in their different homes and uh, a few partners came and uh, supported having drugs delivered to to people's home and to ensure that people really are retained into care. But after COVID, we are not seeing a lot of investment going into that. And still challenges are there. We have, uh, the, the, I've always asked, we have young people in schools um, and young people are always fetched out from school to go and, and get their medication outside school. Could there be a model that is friendly? I like the approach that came from Kenya of uh, red carpet and making sure that service is given uh, very quickly and in a very friendly manner. But these are just pilot countries. How do we ensure that these such uh, good models of having um, medicine delivered to, to the person in need to a person at his or her convenient. Can we start again taking this into the community, having strategies at community level near the community beyond the facility based and ensure that people can access um, care at that level at a minimum cost in terms of being uh, transporting into the nearest facility. Um, then investing in innovations, very interesting, all of us want it, but do we see the will coming again from our, our leaders as government? Again, most of these innovations, most of these interventions are partner funded, but I think we are not seeing strong, strong partnerships in government. And I think as we take the conversation to what is the role of, of industries, I think maybe that's where they need to be coming strong as industries to hold government as they negotiate and come into bilateral agreements. Can there be intentions to have um, protocols or statements from government on how some of this work that is really working well for the community be taken on in going forward, again, for sustainability. Um, yes, we are talking also of care, we've talked of these innovations, but we are also still pressed with the challenge of, um, challenge of having some, some of the medicine or the, 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 the drugs that the community need not be affordable. And this goes to the question of the question of patent rights, question of um, how, are we, how are countries playing a role in ensuring that industries in less developed countries can also effectively provide uh, high effective medicine. Uh, and recently we're having uh, advocates around retention and advocates on accessing um, branded drugs. And we had a community member sharing a story of how he failed to get treatment and had to lose his sight. The treatment that was there was not as strong as the treatment that should be coming from uh, the global north. So how do we now again align and ensure that even where there are issues of adherence, there are issues of um, communities not being able to access uh, high quality medicine that we address, we address the gap and see that medicine are accessible by everybody, regardless of what brand, regardless of where it's coming from. I think I can pause here for now. Thank you, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Imekule, for, for that very um, structure um, ways of, of um, expressing um, the, the, the issues around 
around um, this, this linking um, people to, to care and retain people in care. Um, I, I think like the, we, we have heard uh, quite a lot from the presentations and also from uh, the panelists here on um, the provider side, like, like how we can um, optimize the systems uh, ready for people to come in and to retain them um, in care. But um, now I, I would like to like um, switch um, the, the, the the aspect a bit um, to how we can um, now with like um, different tools available in uh, getting people into testing in um, um, initiating um, treatment and retain them in care. Um, how can we use those tools, your, those um, innovations um, to empower people themselves to be ready to be uh, wanting to get into testing and in, in, into care and to be retained in care. Um, is there any um, um, message that we can use to to kind of like prepare people um, even before they they get into uh, they, they they enter into care or, or uh, then uh, to retain them in care? And, and this question may um, go to um, Todd, to um, Chris, um, and, and also to Serena, please. Uh, thanks so much. I can um, go first. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the messages um, that I'm sure all are aware of, um, but still requires uh, attention is the undetectable equals untransmittable or U equal U message. Um, we all know that's a very powerful message uh, for reducing stigma, both internal stigma, as well as community based stigma, as well as for motivating uh, people living with HIV to adhere to antiretroviral therapy and to try to achieve um, an undetectable viral load. Um, but, you know, it's been um, 2016 is when uh, HPTN uh, 052 study sort of uh, proved uh, the concept of treatment as, as prevention. So it's nearly, you know, it's more than 15 years and we still see a lot of gaps in people's understanding or, or knowledge of the U equal your U message. Um, so I think it still requires sort of a call to attention to uh, double our efforts to ensure that people um, who are at risk or living with HIV understand that message. Um, in Vietnam, uh, you know, I was part of a consortium of partners who worked with the government of Vietnam to um, adapt the equal you message as the official government position and um, use different uh, medium to uh, try to spread the message to both healthcare workers and the community. Um, and it was, uh, um, understood as uh, and sort of accepted as a very successful effort. But nonetheless, um, we still see a lot of gaps in knowledge. And, you know, <clears throat> one of the things I'd like to highlight as we're talking about um, uh, linkage and retention is that often this message is used to counsel patients on adherence, but I think it can be used in these other scenarios as well. And one of the things in Vietnam we're now talking about is uh, like the three moments of you equal you counseling trying to make it akin to sort of the five moments of hand washing, uh, where uh, healthcare workers or counselors, community counselors should be uh, talking to patients about U equal U uh, at the time of a positive HIV test um, is the first moment uh, to encourage linkage to care. And the second moment is initiation of um, ART to encourage uh, adherence and reaching that undetectable level. And the third moment is sort of at the annual uh, visit, you know, viral load visit re um, where you get your viral load results to encourage, you know, to continue to encourage adherence as well as to encourage retention. So if we can, you know, in engage healthcare workers in sort of the three moments of uh, U equal U, then we might be able to get the message out and use it uh, to its fullest capacity. Thank you very much, Todd. Um, that's um, a very interesting way of three steps. Three, three um, points of um, communicating you equals you. Thank you very much. And um, Serena or Chris, uh, would you like to add um, to, to this point? Yes, thank you. Sure, I'd love to add. So um, I can only say that the situation in Port-au-Prince is truly horrifying right now. It is one of the hardest places to work in the world and it is the murder and kidnapping capital of the world. And that has shifted services because it's really a partnership now between the patients and the providers. 
you know, sometimes patients have to urgently leave their house when the gangs come and they take their house. There's been a lot of um, people having to leave urgently, a lot of movements. And so it, it has shifted the conversation. Um, I will say one thing that was very important was the culture of patient-centered and dignified care so that the providers made the patients feel very welcome. Uh, there's also communication. So at every visit, at every contact, ensuring updated communication with the patients, ensuring, trying to make sure they have a phone or a phone card because communication is essential. Uh, the next point, again, Jeskyo is the community. It's located right down in some of the most dangerous slums in Port-au-Prince. And um, patients are included in the discussions of how we need to ensure that we want, we want to help patients thrive. We have to ensure they're able to get their medications and also ensure that if they need a diagnostic evaluation, we, we can provide that also um, via load testing. And so the patients have been involved in things like rapid pathway, adolescent clinics, community sites, home ART. Um, but again, it's a partnership. So if, um, if somebody has just had a gang take their house and they need their medications, they can call the clinic and know they'll feel welcome or come to the clinic. And then the question becomes, how can we help you get your medications? So I would say it is respect and communication and patients being clients, being involved in the way we develop the services. And then lastly, um, there's so many economic barriers for, for clients that we haven't so much addressed today. And I think, um, you have to be willing to hear where is the patient coming from. Motivational interviewing is a key for that we've really established now, which is really talking to the patient, what is your barrier? But you know, if the patient says, I have no food, I cannot take my medication, then it means joining with the patient and trying to solve that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think that's um, probably um, something that, that can be applied across um, the regions. I, I, I feel that um, um, uh, especially in Asia uh, Pacific, um, the culture, the, the paternalistic culture, uh, medical culture uh, is, is also something that, that has been very, very strong. Um, and and to, to say that um, now we would want to um, pay more respect uh, in the partnership, in equal partnership uh, to, to kind of shift away the power relationship between provider and, and clients could be something that 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 is like out of um, um, imagination of many healthcare providers uh, in, in our region. So, so like um, this, this could be something that um, I think um, is, is kind of the, the principle of how we are going to um, <laughs> um, provide HIV services um, in the future. Um, thank you very much, um, Serena. And, and Chris, um, I saw you um, turn on your microphone a few times already. <laughs> sure, yeah, great things. Yeah, wonderful presentations and um, uh, I, I'm just going to perhaps repeat some, some of what Serena and others um, have just said, but but certainly a person-centered approach, um, both to the initial linkage and to retention and care. And I think just stepping back, it's it's always helpful. Uh, I mean, here we're focused on the health ecosystem and the multiple lanes, the health department, the correctional department, social development department, industry. NGOs, private services, but I think it's useful to step back beyond that, that, that most of us live lives not focused on clinics or even our health unless we're sick. And really understanding messaging um, from that standpoint and goals and values from that standpoint. And something like U equals U um, can be very, which Todd was mentioning, can be very powerful and sometimes more powerful than saying, if you don't take your medications, you're gonna die. Because if I feel well, you know, maybe I'll die in 10 years, but maybe I'll get hit by a car in 10 years, as, as many of us who are clinicians have heard patients say. And um, I think taking that step back, really understanding what individuals' priorities are. And then um, I think that gets also into some of the differentiated models of care, both for testing and for service delivery. And context is so important for individuals and really understanding whether it's a young man, what their key messages are, what their key priorities and values in life are at this moment. And, or if it's a, you know, if it's a young woman, if it's a 
somebody just coming out of correctional facility, if it's somebody who's um, um, uh, suffering from uh, substance use disorder, um, how, you know, what the right messaging is and what the right support is. And um, I'll just take a, 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 a step to then narrow that just in terms of the interaction between industry, NGOs, et cetera. While all of these can be seen as different lanes, I think it's more important to see these as intersecting and overlapping lanes. And we've heard some wonderful presentations on like the red carpet and other presentations on how bringing different players together can really provide wonderful context specific services. And then zooming out from that, just some other wonderful presentations from Ruan and Serena about like fundamental academic research that then sets up globally what the right thing to do is, whether it's same day ART or differentiated models of care. And then industry can support um, programs within countries like Red Carpet to fit those contexts. Um, kind of covered a whole bunch of things, but I, I think just reiterating the starting understanding what the person wants and person-centered care. And there are several billion people in this world and um, uh, several billion different needs um, that need to be addressed and can be addressed through appropriate differentiated care. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, very important points there. I think um, it would be good to sort of lean in a little bit to, we had some snippets where we obviously learned a little bit about some of the digital solutions that, that have been used. I guess, um, and probably more so um, the presentations focused on their use in higher income countries. So it'd be great to get the views of the panel and, and particularly Todd, yourself and Job, maybe, you know, your views on what are the role of digital or e-health uh, tools in low and middle income countries? What works and, and what are the limitations? I think it's equally important in this field that we learn from things that have been tested and, and, and maybe didn't succeed and why, as well as knowing what works. So I don't know, Todd, if you want to go first and then and then Job. Right, thanks, Helen. Um... Well, you know, I think when we talk about e-health, um, you know, it's a very broad uh, category of, of, of um, interventions or areas. Um, so if I could just focus it a little bit and talk uh, specifically about telemedicine, so that would be, you know, provider to patient uh, technology assistant care, because I think that is sort of um, an area of intense growth uh, since uh the COVID pandemic sort of catalyzed, catalyzed the need uh, for that to ensure that uh, people could uh, retain and care during um, pandemic related lockdowns, um, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, there's such great potential, I think, um, for, te for telemedicine um, to uh, be one tool that can help us uh, uh, reach the 95-95-95 uh, goals. Um, you know, telemedicine has the potential to improve access uh, for patients, uh, to improve uh, confidentiality, uh, to potentially reduce uh, stigma and discrimination uh, that patients may, may feel uh, if they have to um, uh, go to a health facility uh, in person. Um, and, and um, it, you know, I think specifically it can be an important tool for improving uh, retention and care over, you know, a lifetime of uh, having to take, uh, you know, being in, medicalized in terms of having to attend clinic appointments and take medication. Um, <clears throat> I think it, right now, especially in low middle income, income countries, we're sort of at a point where we don't have a lot of long term data uh, to, to, to give us the evidence that that potential will be realized. But um, I'm sure many on this call are probably in the process of doing uh, you know, well-designed studies uh, to answer those questions for us. And I think we have some data from PrEP. Um, I think PrEP has a little bit further advanced in terms of telemedicine uh, for PrEP, and, and that data looks good. But I think there are some cautions and some limitations of telemedicine that we have to be aware of, um, the potential that it could um, exasperate disparities um, you know, certain populations may be less able to, um, uh, to benefit from telemedicine, whether it re relate to socioeconomic status or um, digital, uh, you know, access or digital um, literacy. Um, so we have to design sort of our models with, with those things in mind. 
Um, and, but, um, um, but I think there's a great potential and, and, and I hope to see more uh, data um, coming in, in the future and then, and then, you know, how these models can be scaled up in low middle income countries in partnerships with, um, you know, local tech companies, um, et cetera. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, thanks, Todd. And and Job, I don't know if you can reflect maybe on on the use um, or role of any digital tools within either the red carpet program that you shared with us earlier, or, or any other programs that EggPath leads. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks. And um, I, I think I did mention, especially um, uh, when we had COVID, and we had to still ensure that the young people are engaged in and you know care. And one of the, the platforms that worked for us, especially with the adolescents and young people, was the use of one, um, a number of, we did an assessment to establish how many of them had access to a phone. When do they have an access to the phone? And um, who is in control of the phone to also determine the, the, the type of engagement that we needed with each of, of them in terms of content? And from that assessment, we were able to establish that some of them we could actually just reach uh, through uh, messaging, text messaging, because they did not have uh, access to probably data bundles and the like. There were those ones who had access to data bundles and we were able to work with them in social media platforms, including WhatsApp messaging and the like, and in, in, in such level of engagement, as well as the use of toll-free lines where the adolescents and young persons could actually reach out uh, to uh, their case managers to be able to follow up on, on some of the, the issues. And I think that was also important in the integration with mental health because other than just looking at um, you know, um, the issues around HIV, the fact that they were also able to ask other issues you know, that were, were you know, causing anxiety among them and the like is, is another lesson that we also learned. And um, I think from that, of course, you know, based on what Todd has also said, you know, uh, options for for uh, telehealth, especially with young people, would actually be another attractive option to look at when engaging with um, these audiences. But I think, you know, from the conversations, um, we've also seen, especially in this country, where a number of other stakeholders have also uh, created other platforms like MyDawa that also enable even people to access you know, other drugs other than, you know, those for, for, for HIV that are also uh, becoming interesting options to be able to uh, support, uh, you know, uh, persons living with HIV and more importantly, um, uh, segmenting the audiences to look at what access do they have and what platform best works for them. Because as you rightly observe, you know, some of the, the settings may not be appropriate for bulk messaging and the like. So I think context specific, um, response is important. Yeah, over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Todd and Job. And I very much agree with both of you that there could be um, several applications of telemedicine of, of e-health um, in, in HIV. And, and that's um, probably beyond um, HIV testing and prep. And, and um, um, the example that, that we have uh, um, demonstrated in Thailand over the past year is the use of um, telehealth for um, doctor consultation um, for same-day ART initiation in um, key population-led clinics. Uh, so, so that's, that's the, the setting without the physical presence of doctors or nurses, uh, but um, the doctor can then phone in and do um, teleconsultation uh, with the physician, uh, with, with the, the clients. Um, so, and, and that has been uh, very successful. We have been doing this for uh, more than 500 um, clients um, so far in, in uh, um, um, clinic serving um, MSM, transgender women and sex workers. And I think like um, this can be applied maybe outside of the HIV field, um, let's say for uh, HCV test and treat um, um, 
um, setting as well. Um, so I, I, I think that's that's one of the technology. And, and the, the next question um, will be around the use of long acting technology, long acting ARV technology. So um, how are you um, um, seeing this long acting ARV uh, to help with um, um, engaging people into um, treatment or re retaining them in treatment or re-engaging some of the clients into um, treatment. Um, and um, maybe this question can go to uh, Mopali um, and um, Eva and, and, and Chris, please. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Natalia. That's an excellent um, uh, segue into the conversation. So, uh, we, I think uh, long acting agents have great promise and potential for treatment and prevention. Um, we all know that there are people who have challenges taking a daily uh, regimen. And for those people, whether it's for treatment or for prevention, taking uh, daily pills can be challenging for a variety of reasons. And long acting agents have the potential to really bring up our numbers in that cascade of care from where you know, some of the really bad numbers of like 57% in the US up higher, closer to our goals above 95. Um, and I think as we reflect on the amazing presentations and discussions so far, when we implement long acting programs and in the case for prevention, we're studying right now a novel agent, which is a six month long acting subcutaneous agent that we're evaluating for prevention in the purpose studies. Um, and I think it's really critical when you implement from the very beginning of considering the trial, where you're gonna have it, who you're gonna partner with, setting up your global community advisory groups to advise you on how you conduct the trial, to do the innovation with intention from the beginning. So the system you set up and the, the you know, we think about this in industry, the label you get, the instructions you get for how to use the medication, how you set up the trial affects that in the end. So you have to be really intentional to make sure you don't exacerbate gaps that we reviewed in the beginning and instead attempt to address them. So in our purpose program, um, and you can look at our website, purposestudies.com, because I don't have time to talk about all of them. One of the things that we've done to think about the promise and potential is really to engage with the community and work in places where we're trying to overrepresent historically underrepresented populations who are disproportionately affected by HIV. So what do I mean by that? That's a lot of words. Um, in the United States and in what we would consider in the global context, key populations in Brazil and South Africa, other parts of Latin America, in Thailand and Vietnam, we're gonna be conducting purpose two, which is um, a study of long acting prep for um, cisgender gay men, transgender women, and for the first time ever, transgender men and gender non-binary people. And we're doing purpose one in South Africa and Uganda and adolescent girls and young women. And we set up our community advisory groups and they told us we needed to change where we worked, who we worked with, to change who we enrolled, to really over-represent the historically underrepresented. And in the United States and in other locations that meant working with sites and investigators who had expertise in these underrepresented populations, who worked with chemsex populations or who worked with gender affirming care um, to and help us enroll um, gender diverse populations. And in South Africa and Uganda, it meant in including and supporting people in their reproductive choices. So our trial is the first trial to include adolescents in the adult pivotal trials. And it's our first trial to support people in getting pregnant if they want to, or contraception if they don't want to. And that way, um, you know, one of the people who advised us at the very beginning of starting Purpose One was a pregnant sex worker who said, do not exclude people like me in the clinical trial. So we have all the data about the disproportionate risk of pregnant women, but I still think about her face as I try to convince partners like IRBs and ethics committees, and even internally, we have to change hearts and minds to be able to include pregnant people in, in clinical trials. And we wanna set it up so we're doing it in the trial. So when and if the drug is approved, it can make the most maximal impact in the communities that are most disproportionately affected. 
So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to yeah. share about that. Thank you. And that would speed up um, the translation from science into implementation as well. Thank you very much, um, Mopali. Um, Eva? Thank you. Um, I think there's one word here and it's cost. Um, we just cannot afford right now, at least in the, the global south with our fragile healthcare systems to pay five times as much um, and more than, you know, right now dual therapy, generic dual therapy is going to be deep, dirt cheap and very effective. And when you have a healthcare system that is in trouble, and fragile. You know, if you're running out of essential medications for comorbidities, you can't rationalize spending that much money. So I think I, I love everyone in the industry. And again, they've helped us tremendously every every step of the way. But we have to demand collectively that these prices are decreased and the patents are released. And, you know, including the technological patents, we've seen what happened with COVID. And COVID taught us that we can deliver vaccines. We can do it. You know, I mean, we've done amazing things. Everyone's told stories of amazing things. Implementation science, we can do it, but we can't do it at the expense of, of dwindling, um, you know, economic support from develop, development partners, the state of the global economic situation. You know, uh, this is something that is really, is, it, we, have to, we have to speak collectively together. We have to be activists to make sure that we continuously say this. I mean, otherwise, you know, injectables are going to only be able to be used in very select populations. And I can tell you, everybody wants them. All HIV positive patients are saying, we want it when the injectable is coming. And we want to say immediately, right? So this isn't a bounce back to industry to say, what do we do? How did we do it? How did we get DTG cheap? How did we manage to, you know, um, do all the things that we've, that we've done in the past 25 years? We did it collectively with one voice. So thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very strong um, message, um, Eva. Um, and Chris, um, maybe you are the last um, person to say um, a few words here. <laughs> Thank Just a you. few words, because uh, both uh, Lopali and Eva said, said really important things and, and wonderful. I, I think just a shout out to what Gilead is doing and what Lopali described, engaging those community advisory boards. And I think, um, I don't know specifically what they have in the pipeline, but I know that industry certainly has supported just contextual innovation. And I think just to highlight, um, even when everyone's clamoring for a product and we can say we could do PrEP in say uh, birth control clinics or sexual health clinics, uh, I mean, over 60% of pregnancies in South Africa are unintended. And many of those are truly unintended going to abortion. It's not just, well, okay, unintended, but we're happy to have the child. So I think really understanding how we can actually deliver these and the current systems of delivering PrEP or ART uh, for, AR, for, for long acting, again, coming back to context and what each individual needs, needs to be innovated. And once these wonderful clinical trials demonstrate the effectiveness, then really the implementation science at a country level, supported hopefully by industry, supported by academia, supported by NGOs, um, will help to show how we can deliver to those populations that need it. And even as as Ava said, um, maybe not everyone will will have it, but I think it certainly will have a role um, for specific populations who otherwise just cannot be on ART for one reason or cannot be on PrEP and are at high risk for HIV to, to really control the epidemic and get to 95, 95, 95. Um, thank you so much. And um, I'm concerning of the time here, and, and it has been a wonderful roundtable um, discussion um, today. And, and I would like to um, thank, uh, on behalf of um, the IAS uh, in Industrial um, Lesson um, um, team, as well as um, my co chair, um, Helen, um, here, all the presenters and all the panelists, we have had a wonderful um, discussions. And I uh, think we have heard. Um, 
um, a lot um, repeatedly about um, how we uh, should um, have community leadership in the design, in the co-delivering of services, as well as the monitoring of services, um, and how we uh, should um, then um, have the um, use the U equals U communications like more effectively at every steps of um, getting people into care and retain people in, in care, um, how we uh, must pay um, respect um, and, and, and pay um, in, um, in uh, our, our uh, interest into like autonomies of our clients, um, how we can use uh, differentiated service delivery more uh, efficiently, um, how we can use uh, e-health, how we can use um, uh, long acting and territorial virals in improving um, care and retention. Uh, we heard about the uh, potentials as well as uh, challenges around these technologies. And um, lastly, um, the, the importance of working together as a partnership in between um, those who are researchers, implementers, uh, communities, um, industry, um, and, and, and uh, funders. No? All of us all together can, can certainly uh, are optimizing what we are doing um, um, today. And um, I would like to now um, close um, the session and uh, wish you all a very uh, wonderful uh, days and nights <laughs> after uh, the call today. Thank you very much to, to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.